So we will begin today's introduction of Professor Charles Krebs, who's an Emeritus Professor of Zoology at the University of British Columbia. He's also an adjunct professor at the Institute of Applied uh, Ecology uh, in the University of Canberra, where he's actually called a thinker in residence. And you can see his education, he has um, a mixed background, initially in the US and then in, in Canada. And he's a person that has been recognised for his impact in science and for quite a number of awards. And in particular, um, the awards associated with being an um, a fellow of different academies of sciences around the globe, including Norway, Australia, Canada, and it's very unusual to be able to have become a fellow of um, an Academy of Sciences in one country, let alone three. He's also, um, another award which is not listed there as such, is he's also an honorary professor of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And, that, and he was the first person to be awarded that standing from outside of China. He has many other awards which have been um, bestowed upon him from those people in the, the mammal area, the ecology area, and that is also a very clear indication of his, um, of his standing in science. Now, the, one of the things I just want to draw to your attention is the number of publications that he has. And Charlie has been retired now for more than 10 years. And you can see that up until, uh, in total, he's published more than 250 publications. It's interesting when you go to the Web of Science that they don't go prior to 1975. It's like prehistory. So Charlie was publishing back in prehistory days. And since his retirement, he's still published 67 papers. And not many of us here would have published that many in our productive scientific career as we stand now. And the other thing to look at is his H score. And as people here at Erie, H score sort of came about about a year before Akim Doberman took over his role. And once he, he mentioned that in his uh, seminar as um, his introduction to being DDGR for re or DDG for research here at Erie, everyone rapid, rapidly went and looked up H scores. And said Charlie, since he's retired, is 20. And again, very few of us here would have a H score higher than 20. So it, it really it is quite an honour to have Charlie here um, to, to talk to us here at Erie. And he's also been probably best known for the number of publications that he has in terms of books. And a number of, of, of us here who were doing our studies even back in the 1970s uh, remember having Krebs and the Ecology uh, textbook as being one of the main texts that we had during our undergraduate courses. So Charlie, I'm pleased to call upon you to give your seminar today. Thank you, Grant, for those kind words. Uh, what I'd like to do is give you an ecologist view of agricultural science. So this is kind of stepping on toes. I realize I'm not classified as an agricultural scientist, but I think it's useful for any science to have people outside, nearby sciences, uh, have a look at them and, and give a few comments. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about what ecology, what is ecologists trying to do? What are they trying to do? What was the purpose you might? And then I want to talk about a triumvirate of problems, mainly agriculture, as you'll see, but I also want to talk about biodiversity, the biodiversity crisis and the population crisis. Now, I want to talk about all of those because they are a complete storm of problems that are totally intertwined. So if you worry about the biodiversity crisis, you must also worry about agricultural policy. And you must worry about population, human population. And so that's why I want to try to tie those together at least a little bit. And then I want to give you a few ecological principles for solving the agricultural crisis. 
to say what, you know, how does the ecologist view uh, these problems and then give you a summary? Now, all sciences really operate this way. We get some kind of understanding in our case, in my case, we we're worrying about ecological understanding. Um, and we use that then to make some kind of management recommendations about what might be done. These are simply recommendations and they may be implemented in policy. And that's the hope of all scientists to make that achieve some understanding, make some recommendations, and have them translated into policy. Uh, but what happens here is uh, a blockage occurs very often somewhere along the line. And this produces what I call the politics of ignorance. And I'll come back to that in the end. Now you may think that uh, that never occurs, but that must mean you're very young because this is happening all the time. Um, and I won't tell you who the bad guys are, but you might be able to address a number of politicians and other very rich people who don't like to hear the messages, in this case, of ecology are, for that matter of agricultural science. Well, let me start with the basic principle. Now I'm preaching to the converted here. Um, but let's realize, and, and again, this seems to be some people who don't seem to realize this, that the Earth has some physical, chemical, biological limitations. We only have one planet to work with. And to talk about moving to other planets is kind of complete nonsense. I don't know why the newspapers even report such crazy things. We have one planet, we've got to take care of it, okay? And that's the basic premise we have to start with for all of this discussion. Mm -hmm. And my question then is, are the current ways we're approaching these problems sustainable? Okay, sustainability is a word which is used very loosely in the newspapers uh, and in advertisements and so on. has to be a bit worried about what sustainability is. Um, but I think the native people of northern Canada have a good idea of what sustainability is. They say what we have to worry about is what the world in our area will look like for seven generations ahead of us. So well, that's a couple of hundred years. The ecologist looks at problems on a very long time scale, not the time scale of politicians. We're talking about three months or three years. We look at problems in terms of 50, 100, 200, even more. There are three key areas, as I mentioned, agriculture, biodiversity, and population, and we'll deal with those. And there are really two steps ecologists and any scientist can take to evaluate the current situation and then suggest possible solutions. Okay, so there are lots of these maps floating around. In this case, it's a, a global hunger index from last year. And it gets, again, this is only one aspect of hunger, but you can see here an index. The more red the color, the more alarming the, the problems. India and Africa are typically the worst in terms of global hunger, but all the countries, even the United States and Canada, have groups of people who are suffering hunger, and so they cannot be ignored. And so there's obviously a, a, a lot of problems, and this has led to a, 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 an extensive discussion on global food security and how to relieve these problems of hunger, which really are a humanitarian problem of a, a, a very serious sort. So there are problems in the world, and they're concentrated, as you can see, largely in Africa. Are spread around the world, so no one is immune to this. Now, if you start looking at agricultural products, of which rice, of course, is a very key one here, but wheat in other parts of the world, and you can get these data for, for any crop. And this goes back now to 1960, uh, long ago, and, and it's projected now up to 2050, and that's only, what, 30 odd years away, 35 years away. That's not, again, very far away. And so you got data up to here, about 2010, 2011. That's, so rice production, and this is yield in tons per hectare. Rice production has been going up about 1% per year. Um, and wheat, about not quite 1% per year. And so we got two lines here. If you want to project the future, you want to say, what do we need to do? Well, these people say we've got to double the food production. That means you've got to start increasing this rate to 2.4% a year. Uh, to get up to this dotted line point up here. But if you just project in the simplest way of looking at the world, just fit a line to this and keep going, you can see we're going to be very short, and we're going to be increasingly short of, of food production for the world. So not only do we have hunger now, uh, this, if you just project this, 
it's going to get worse, though we, we have a problem. We have a very big problem if we're going to double global food production. Okay, so now one way to do that is to take more land. Let's go plow up more uh, real estate out there. And uh, that is not happening, okay? And so here's some data. If you look at that, this is again from 1970, the last 40 years. And this is the land area uh, used for these various things, the arable crops, the meadows and pastures for using meat production or milk, and the total agricultural area. Uh, so you can see from this that since 1991, there's really, right in the middle of this graph, there's been no change in land area use. So basically, you can argue pretty strongly in most countries, there is no land left that you can plow up and plant in agriculture, you cannot keep expanding the so-called footprint of agriculture. So if somebody says to you, oh, it's very simple, we got all of northern Canada, whatever, you've got the deserts of Australia, we just plow them up, plant them in rice or wheat or whatever. You know, they're talking, we would say through their half, they're talking complete nonsense. And there is no land, there's very little land left uh, that you can plow up. So you cannot increase food production by spreading out and increasing land. So there's a constraint, okay? The world is a constraint. There's only so many hectares of good farmland around. Now there are five solutions. So if you go and read the literature, and again, the extensive literature on this, uh, you can say, what are the solutions to this problem? I just talked about food security. Uh, first of all, you stop expanding the footprint of agriculture, and they just said you can't do that anyway. And there's no good land left. Well, so that's probably not a problem anymore, or at least not much of a problem. We have to close the world yield gaps, and that's the item I was talking about before. We need to increase the yield of rice and wheat and crops we use. We need to use resources more efficiently. I'll come back to all of these uh, with some detailed data. We need to shift our diets away from meat. There's a big push, push us in a, a, to a vegetarian fish and aquatic resources, and reduce food waste, all of these things are fairly straightforward, and you can make these recommendations, but the problem is to implement them. How do you change people's attitudes, and that is a social science problem, which I think is really critical, and which many of you here have been working on. So, what we can do is do this, well, how do we achieve that, and what are the problems facing us that don't allow us to do what we well, here's an example of the kind of thing you can find in the literature. This is the maize yield, or corn, as we would call it in North America, the maize yield in Africa. And here it is a few years ago. And the colors here, if you can't read this, the redder the color, the lower the productivity. The greener the color, the better the productivity. So here it is in 2000, roughly what it is now. And then you can calculate uh, the potential yield in Africa, which is, again, one of the hunger problem areas of the world. Potential yields, if we have optimum use of rainwater, nutrients, weeds, and disease management, the kind of things many of you worry about. Now, this is what Africa could look like, and you can see the crop areas are mostly very green. That is to say, you're producing maybe 8 to 10 tons per hectare, as opposed to over here, you're producing 1 or 2 tons per hectare. So that's the kind of, if you like, uh, image you, you'd like the world to come to, say, by 2030 or 2050. Uh, but the question is, how do you get there? So you can do these calculations. I, I think they're a bit of what we would call, in English, pie in the sky. Um, but it's good to have pie in the sky. That is, to have dreams of what you might be able to do. Uh, but the real problem is how you get there. And that's something we uh, will talk about momentarily. Now, the premise of this whole talk is that agriculture is applied ecology. So when I tell all my agricultural friends that all they are is applied ecologists, they're you know, they're very consultant because we are real scientists and new ecologists on the totem pole of science, ecology is way down at the bottom and agriculture. But basically, you're applied ecologists. And so if that's true, you have to operate under the principles of applied ecology or ecology in general, environmental science in general. And so what I want to do as I go through is talk about what principles there are that the applied ecologists and environmental scientists have recognized and where agricultural sits among those principles. 
Now, the problems, the fundamental issues we will come back to, which makes this a perfect storm, is that agriculture reduces biodiversity. I'll show you some data in a moment, but it's basic. If you clear land in particular, biodiversity, the number of species out there in the natural world, that goes down. And that's the basis that you read about in the newspapers. And the question is, is this reversible? Does agriculture always have to knock down biodiversity? And of course, it doesn't. It doesn't mean we have to change how we do agriculture. Uh, agriculture exacerbates climate change. OK, that is the a number one problem the world is facing, climate change. It's uh, like a, you would say a snowball. You wouldn't know what a snowball is here. But in fact, a bulldozer coming at us very slowly. Uh, and the problem is it's very slow. And so we have a lot of people who say it's not happening. Like the typhoon outside, it's not happening. We'll look out there, but perfectly fine. But it's typhoon. So what can you do? Can you neutralize that somehow? And, and again, many people here are working on that sort of issue. Well, how do we uh, make agricultural science produce less so-called greenhouse gases? Critical, critical. Okay, let's go back to sustainability of agriculture. The ecological general generalization number one in the world. You ask me how just. Ecosystems, what out there in the natural world, it runs on solar energy, okay? Renewable energy from the sun. Uh, but current agriculture runs on non-renewable resources. Okay, we have an immediate conflict here. Agriculture runs on oil, it runs on natural gas, it runs on coal, it runs on fertilizers that we'll talk about in a moment. So somehow agriculture has to transition to renewable resources. How are we going to do that? And so where, where are we going with industrial agriculture? Um, I'm not going to talk much about oil and natural gas. Again, if you take a perspective of 10 or 20 years, we've got plenty of oil and natural gas. I'm not going to worry in my lifetime about oil and natural gas. There'll be lots of there. But in 200 years, 400 years, at some point, oil and natural gas are going to run out. Okay, The world does not have an infinite supply of these things. And what are we going to do about it? Have we transition? to avoid that problem. So we have to get the renewable energy. Gigantic problem. Many of you here are working on this sort of thing. And, and I think the critical aspect of all of this for agricultural research is the devil of trying to do this is in the details. How exactly can you do this in the Philippines with lowland rice or upland rice or whatever? And that requires an enormous amount of work, which <coughs> many of you are involved with here. Now, uh, you can continue to use non-renewable resources, at least for the short term, only if you can remove their harmful effects. And there are lots of harmful effects on air, exacerbates uh, climate change, water pollution, and we'll come back to that briefly in mind. So this is an important, very technical problem in ecological engineering, if you want to call it, or, sorry, energy engineering, and I'm not competent to talk about it in that great detail. All I can say is, it is a gigantic problem staring us in the face, and we should be worrying about it and devoting resources to trying to transition, if you like, away from these harmful effects. OK, so that's the problem. We've got to get back to renewable energy. Second, ecological generalization can say, how does the world run out there? It runs because nutrient input into an ecosystem, basically you talk about soils, if you like, or water, that has to equal nutrient output. There has to be an equilibrium there. So if you're taking out more than you're putting in, so to speak, then you're going to be in trouble. It's like a bank account. Think of it as a bank account. If you take more money out of the bank than you put in, you're in trouble. Unless you're in the United States, where you seem to be able to print money. But anyway, you can't do that. Crop production depends on fertilizers. We all know that. And then nitrogen is limiting in many cropping systems, in broad sense, many soils. But you also need phosphate. So there's at least two key things that we need to talk about, but I want to talk a little bit about that. Fertilizer problems, the first one I think is nitrogen. Nitrogen is a positive and a negative factor. Uh, and again, you, you know this crop production depends on the use of fertilizer input, but biodiversity, the number of species out there in the natural world, declines with nitrogen input. Lots of data on this. And water pollution uh, results from excessive nitrogen. So let me show you some data. To think, well, sorry, I should talk about the nitrogen cycle. The ecologists like to talk about how much, in this case, nitrogen is 
coming in. Um, B and F is biological nitrogen fixation. There's certain plants and an algae that fix nitrogen out of the air. They pump it into compounds that are useful for organisms. So that's what this is. Um, these and then lightning fixes some nitrogen. But look at these purple arrows. The purple arrows are what people are doing, fertilizer production, combustion, driving cars and trucks, agricultural um, nitrogen fixation, cows and whatever. And so when you look at the total of this, this is the global nitrogen cycle. Um, the amount going on in the world today, about half of it is being driven by people. So we have had a massive impact uh, as humans on the nitrogen cycle. And that has all sorts of consequences uh, for nitrogen coming in to forested areas, areas of national parks, so we have the treatment of but the air brings in extra nitrogen and it's changing. Time growth and ecosystem dynamics. So that's the kind of impact, at least in some nice nutrients that humans are having. Well, here's the graph I've been promising you. This is in Europe now. These are data gathered from many, many studies a few years ago. So what we have here is the annual nitrogen input. How much nitrogen per hectare goes into the farming area each year? And here's the number of plant species in 100 square meters. And you don't have to be a great statistician to see this, this relationship. It goes down dramatically. The biodiversity, in this case, the number of plant species is much less than around 20 when you get way out here, where it might be three times that amount that low nitrogen input. Now, there's a lot of scattering here, and that suggests you could improve some of this negative relationship by careful work. And there is, of course, careful work because many people realize, well, we're wasting nitrogen out here. We're putting too much on. It flows out into the rivers and the lakes, causes endless problems there, and it's in the nearby ocean where the rivers go. Okay, so there's a biodiversity conflict here in favor of keeping plants in the landscape, all the species of plants, and you cannot be fertilizer with nitrogen. So more nitrogen fertilizer, fewer plants. You show over and over again in the ecosystem. Well, here's a classic curve. These are old curves now that the agricultural people have known about for years. We got, again, nitrogen fertilizer, kilograms per hectare. This is done on corn or maize in Iowa. But again, you can produce these curves for any crop in almost any area. This is the corn grain or maize grain tons per hectare. And you can see as you put more and more nitrogen on, you reach a plateau. You reach so-called diminishing returns. So you're wasting your money if you go beyond this point. You, know, you put a lot of nitrogen on. But you know, the limiting process in this system becomes not nitrogen in the soil, but other things like water, phosphate, or something else. That can be true. And, and so it's these limitations that the world imposes on us. And you can wish that limitation wasn't there, but it is there and it's imposed by the natural processes. And so we want to avoid wasting, in this case, nitrogen fertilizer, which we have been doing, certainly in the, the developed countries, hysterical way. But again, attempts to change that. Now let's look at these in a little bit more detail. Nitrogen is produced from natural gas. Now, many people don't know that, you probably all do. Um, so it's really coming out of the oil and gas industry. Um, phosphate comes from rocks, okay? So that's another fundamental thing a lot of people don't worry about. Uh, so nitrogen is tied to oil. Oil availability and price, and again, you don't have to read very much of the papers to realize the oil is a non-renewable resource. We can rip up the world, getting more and more of it. That just means the day of reckoning is pushed off to your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. But it's going to run out. It'll become so scarce, it'll be so expensive that no one will be able to use it. So the whole oil thing, and we'll talk more about, but uh, anything that this is an essential nitrogen uh, uh, element for, for fertilizer, and yet it's tied into oil production. A real storm. Phosphate is limited by rock formation. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I find it another fascinating aspect of fertilizer. Everybody gets fertilizer, oh, lots of you know, phosphate. And so this is the world phosphate. This is a paper from 2007, eight years ago, seven years ago. 
And this is the world's phosphate production, production in you know, mega, uh, megatons, uh, megagrams. Anyway, you can see the blue line is production. It goes around, bounces around a bit. And uh, then you get this, your favorite statistician out, and he or she can fits the curve like this. And this is uh, the peak phosphate, peak phosphorus curve. Okay, it's much the stuff. And I'm going to carry on and talk a little more about it. Um, so you fit a nice amount of curve. And this is, of course, a reflection of the peak oil curve. And I'll come back to that. The peak oil is what sort of happened to. Uh, in, this, in this case, these guys fitted this curve and said somewhere around 1985, 1990, we did peak phosphorus. And it just kind of went out. Because there's only so much rock out there with phosphate in it. Uh, and so this caused, of course, the storm papers about peak phosphate. And this is the of the data. Okay, world phosphorus fertilizer use millions of tons of phosphate from 1960 in the last 50 years. Okay, uh, lots of papers on this. And here's the 5% growth in phosphate fertilizer use. Um, okay, a bit of a decline here because of economic problems in China or whatever. Um, and since then, it's been about a 2% increase. And now you can fit a curve to this. There's only so much phosphate rock on the Earth's surface. Uh, well, phosphorus. You know, we wouldn't be here if there's no phosphorus. And it's an essential element for all of us beings. And now there is renewable phosphorus. The phosphate from bird mono, bird droppings. And this is Christmas Island in Nauru. Uh, they were all mined out um, probably 50 or 70 years ago. So there are no more of that. There's a lot there, but it accumulated over thousands of years. Renewable in the normal sense of the word, it's all wrong. Non renewable, so maybe get some sediments in rock. Okay. Where are they? They're in Morocco, China, the US. It's a finite resource. So the geologists have mapped the earth, and they can tell you, obviously, with a bit of air, how much phosphate rock is left out there. Um, and there's only so much, so this is completely non renewable. There is no way to make phosphate that I know that I've ever read about. And when we run out of that rock, we are in trouble. So you can say, will we run out of phosphorus? And so our fertilizer we can buy so easily now in 100 years or whatever. We will not be able to do that. So the quality, and this is what happens classical economics, the quality of the resource uh, goes down, the cost will increase, it's harder to get the rock further away from the ocean, the shipping lanes or whatever. And there's extremely variable in estimates of how much phosphorus is left in the rock. So again, we can love arguments going on. And uh, these chaps have tried to pull that data together, say, how much phosphorus do you think is really out there? And so the next table, I hope, will show you that. This is the lifetime, estimated lifetime, from a series of papers going over the last 20 odd years. Um, and the red column is the estimated lifetime of reserve, the world phosphate rock reserve. How much rock is out there that we can crunch up and use in fertilizer? Um, and this is the estimated year of depletion, and that's functions that economists like to make. And so you can look at all of this and say, well, here's a really optimistic person who thinks it might take three or four hundred years. But most of these people are talking about something around a hundred years or less. Now, that's not a very long time span. If you're a teenager now, you know your grandchildren are going to be running around when phosphate runs out. What kind of a legacy are you leaving for them? if you're not doing something about this. Even at 400 years, an ecologist would say, that's very soon. We want to be here. We, as human beings, we want to be here for a thousand years. Turns out, don't worry about it. That's, that's the only rock that's out there. And so here's the same curve, same data I showed you before. Again, up to the year 2010, which would be year 1000. And so you got the data up to there. And uh, so what do you do if you're statistics person, you know, you can extrapolate this to a accent of the ah, this will go on forever and we'll all be live happily ever after. Or you can put this peak phosphorus curve in there. And so again, depending on your assumptions, statistical assumptions, you may add another 150 years. And that buys us time and that is useful to buy time, but it, it means sooner or later you're going to be in trouble and we ought to start thinking.